just about blew my nads when the rail started to jangle and ping and scatter the dirty mice back into their cracks. In my excitement, I stepped back onto a Caribbean woman's Harrods bags, sending her sugared bonbons pinballing. She glared daggers at me, but I didn't care, because then the tube squealed out of the stinking iron dust and stopped. Rupert said, Stop acting like a defective, you're 22 for God's sake. Which was true, but I didn't care about that either. It was my first time in the city. We rode a few stops before Rupert said we needed to change lines. Rupert was my older brother, and I sometimes called him the Roop because it narked him. He opened up reptiles and stuff for a living, kept their guts and flaps splayed with pins while he fiddled their gizzards, draining their fluids and oozes into tubes and beakers and that. A biologist of some kind, though never ask for specifics or you'll be there all night. I made that mistake once and ended up missing the start of my program. Rupert was ahead of me on the station escalator, pretty accordion music floating down from the top. Between Rupert and I was an elderly lady. She peered at a perfume advert as it passed and asked me, What brand are those bottles? She was beautiful, I thought, in a Lambeth Walk kind of a way. Estee Lauder, I said. Her smile smeared with lipstick. Is it now? I'm sorry, but my eyes are terrible. Do you know, it was that wicked hospital that did it. They asked me to take part in some experimental eye surgery, but the buggers made them worse. I'm almost blind now. Rupert made a show of studying his thumbnails, but I knew he was listening. That sucks, I said. She was still smiling. Of course I complained, but I'd already signed the waiver. I said to them, if I could read the small print, then I wouldn't need the surgery, would I? Suppose not, I said. Is it getting worse? Much worse. Until about four years ago, I was still able to paint. Clouds, mostly. I used to paint. As silly as that sounds. I didn't think it was silly. Well, I'm sorry. She chuckled, and I wondered how she could chuckle about something so horrible. She continued. But I've recently met someone through my therapist, a Russian girl, Anna. She reads to me in the afternoons, and she told me she cured her own bad eyesight in three months. From above, Rupert threw her a look. Russia gets a lot of bad press, I said. But if that's true, then that's amazing. Her smile spread and crinkled the flesh around her eyes, which were green and gold and frosted over. How are your eyes? she asked. I pushed my thick NHS specs up my nose. Not great. Rupert says they're shaped like rugby balls. Well, she said, Anna has taught me about computers too. If you have an email address, I'll send you the exercises. Yeah? I was really making friends here. I scribbled my address in big letters on the back of a flyer for a 100% discreet Turkish baths a bored looking man had been giving out at the train station. The escalator fed us into a bottleneck of bodies. The accordion player huddled in a corner, the accordion itself guts red, and I could see Rupert was getting pissed off because he was banging his wrists together. He did that a lot. I shoved past a stream of people that had separated me from the woman. Hey, I said to her, you're like the first person I've met here. My brother over there says London's full of lizards, but you seem really nice. Oh, don't. She found her face theatrically with long artist's fingers. So this is your first time in the city? She asked. Yeah. Wonderful. Any special occasion? Well, I said, they've just thawed out our mother. Commuters bumped us apart again. I shouted to her, but the look in her failing eyes was suddenly vulnerable and confused. I didn't like to leave her like that but Rupert was already hauling me away. I held up my hand in goodbye. It was all I could do. That's pretty messed up about her eyes, isn't it? I said as we heaved through the crowd. The Rupert sighed. She said it herself. She signed up for it. 
When science makes a breakthrough, people queue up to sing its praises, but when experimentation, which is, after all, the prerequisite of said breakthrough, yields error, here he made a slash across his own throat with the edge of his hand. It's pure hypocrisy, rank ignorance. And that Russian girl's eye exercises, I didn't already know. He squeezed between two Rastafarians and made for the district line. Hokum. But people would rather cling to their beliefs than face reality. We got on another tube. I saw a beautiful girl with bright orange hair and a banjo slung over her back. I smiled at her all, then tried to smile at Rupert, but he had his head buried in some very heavy looking paperwork. Mother stuff. She'd become ill when Stinker was still a kitten and the World Trade Center attack happened. No cure yet, the doctors had said. They were close, but it could take another five or six years, a decade even, and she just didn't have that long. The news hit me like a dinosaur ending comet. I was only 12 then, not that age matters when it comes to losing your mother. I kept thinking that I'd be an orphan because our dad had done a bunk not long after I'd been born. A fact I'd had to work very hard to convince myself had nothing to do with me. Then Rupert brought up cryonics. Not cryogenics, he'd said. Popular culture had latched onto that word, a nonsense Hollywood word. Sitting in the kitchen, I still remember the cockerels on the tablecloth as Rupert explained. He had just graduated from university with a real degree, his emphasis and had lots of cold, mechanical-looking diagrams spread out on the table. My mother, so very pale and weak, either due to her ravenous illness or because her firstborn was explaining how he intended to suck out all her blood and replace it with something called dimethyl sulfoxide before sealing her in a liquid nitrogen casket. Love, she said, how can we know it's safe? Rupert covered one of her hands with both of his own. Mum. These people are Americans, he said. They've played golf on the moon. They know what they're doing. I imagined my mother sunk down in frozen blackness with wires and pipes sticking out of her, open eyes rolled up egg white, and I started to bawl. But what if it doesn't work? You can't know everything. Rupert stood up, brushed imagined crumbs from his crotch. What I don't know about this isn't worth knowing. Mum, don't listen to him. This'll work. You realise, with the technology we have these days, to let nature take its course would be the most unnatural thing we could do. Her hands wrestled each other in her lap. She could always be taught things, our mother. I suppose that's why she ended up with someone like my father, who, by all accounts, made a lot of promises he didn't keep. Anyway, long story short, she agreed. Rupert took her to the place and left her there like a pet primed for the final needle. Later, when he got home, he came into my room and put one of his pink, hairless hands on my shoulder. A gesture so rare that its very normality felt like a gross embarrassment. Like I'd walked in on him applying his hemorrhoid cream. Perhaps sensing this, the Roop withdrew his hand. Just the two of us now, he said. What will she be like? I asked Rupert as we left the underground. Well, he said, she's been reanimated for nearly a fortnight now according to progress reports. Biometrics are normal, though she'll be disorientated, I expect, probably suffering memory loss, some sensory impediment and temporary motor function reduction. Not to mention the prefrontal cortex anomalies. He scanned the street to get his bearings. But I expect the vitrification process mitigated the worst. A few more weeks, she'll be fine. She'll be mum. He smiled then, another rarity. He had pointy teeth, whereas I had flat, scrabble-tile ones. 
It's going to be nuts for her, isn't it? Seeing us, like, all these years older. Undoubtedly. We can't expose her to too much sensory information all at once. Acclimatise her gradually. Look sharp, here it is. We came up on this ratty looking grey building that reminded me of where I went to sign on. A sign above the door saying, D. Incheps Life Extension Foundation, Warland, Wyoming, Stepney Green, London, Bagtayarlaik, Ashgabat. Rupert spent a few minutes in conversation with the receptionist, then I followed him down multiple corridors to a waiting room. He looked nervous and it did something to his face I'd never seen before, like his skull had shrunk under his meat. Wait here, he said. When he left, I tried to read a magazine about trout fishing, but the words floated free of their sentences. I want desperately to say that I'd thought about her every day since she'd been frozen, but I hadn't. I couldn't. What did that say about me? Sometimes the guilt had become too much and I'd gone to Rupert. I'm a bad son, I said to him. He had this look he always did on me, this kind of weary, looking over the top of whatever he was reading look. Stegodiphus lineatus, he said. I had no response to that. He punched the words for my benefit. Stegodiphus lineatus. Southern European arachnid. When the eggs hatch, the offspring devour their mother. Oh. So, he said, settling back to his book. As offspring go, there are worse. After a thousand years, Rupert came back with our mother in a wheelchair. She looked like she'd washed up on a Siberian beach. Translucent carrier bag skin, thin tangles of glued on looking hair plugged into her scalp. She saw me and smiled weakly, and her voice was a scratch, as she said, Daniel. Then something amazing happened. Rupert cried. Then I cried. We both cried and cried and cried. Mum didn't cry though. I'd lived with Rupert ever since we'd frozen her and everything was ready for her return. We'd converted Rupert's study into another bedroom and painted it in relaxing blues and greens. Put a record player in there, her old Linda Ronstadt LPs, her knickknacks and doilies. We wheeled Mum through the door. She hadn't said much on the way home. She seemed tired. After we took her upstairs and put her to bed, when it was just me and Rupert in the living room, I said, she doesn't seem right, does she? Rupert eyed me like a particularly furry Petri dish. She's been frozen for more than a decade. Her faculties are jet lagged. Damn, for her sake, keep it together. I picked up a framed photograph of the three of us. I looked about six in it and I had no front teeth. I know that, I said, I know, but it's like she wasn't even happy she'd be brought back to life. What? Rupert hissed. She was never dead, you moron. Her body was in stasis. The cells that make up her eyelashes today are the exact same cells that made up her eyelashes 12 years ago. She is exactly the same as the day we left her, and that is precisely because she didn't die. His head went purple around the edges. Okay, don't get mad, I said, but I was thinking on the train back. What if she isn't the same? What if when she was frozen and her heart stopped? What if like her soul left her body and it's somewhere else now even though she's here? I watched his face collapse in slow dawning disgust. Soul? Well, yeah, I mean, maybe not like it's gone to heaven or anything, but her spirit or the individual bit of energy that was in her has now, like, been absorbed back into the earth or something. Or maybe, maybe it has gone to heaven. Either way, what if whatever was in her before 
hasn't come back. For a permatweeded man on the wrong side of 30, he moved like lubed lightning in his hush puppies. He was on me, his meaty breath in my face. Daniel, you know fuck all about fuck all. You're an idiot with no qualifications, no drive, no nous. Now, listen to me, me who knows things about things. There is no soul, right? There is only neuroscience. We have mapped the brain and there is no room for a soul in there to hide. Now, our mother needs calm and normalcy in order to convalesce. You, sneaking around, treating her like a fucking zombie, isn't going to allow her to do that, is it? Stinker the cat waddled into the living room. He was getting on now. He came over to where me and Rupert were standing and gazed up the stairs. Suddenly, he arched his back and hissed, his fur jazzing vertical. Oh, what's the matter with him? Rupert spat and went to grab him. But Stinker freaked and raked three strips of red down my brother's wrist. Rupert swore and made another grab, but Stinker had already slunk between my brother's legs into the kitchen and out the cat flap. The roop nursed his dripping hand. I'll see that bastard in hell, he said. That evening, in the kitchen, the cockerel tablecloth was long gone. We were having soup, that being the only thing Mum could stomach. Hers had a lot of different drugs stirred into it. She sat in her wheelchair and her cloudy eyes peered at us and I realised that if I took Rupert's view of things, that Mum was essentially the same person as when we'd frozen her, then she and my brother were now a lot closer in age. I squinted my mind at the two of them and just for a moment I had both a mother and a father. Rupert and I chatted away about things we'd all done together before the freeze, trying to involve Mum as much as we could, but she just nodded in a creaky way and said things like, Yes, I remember that. And that happened in the summer. You were nine years old. Every now and again she tried to smile, but it looked like her facial muscles were being yanked up and on the kind of fish hooks I'd seen in that trout magazine at the complex. We were still eating when Stinker returned, and as soon as he clapped eyes on Mum, his back went up and he started meowing in a very edgy way. Stinker the cat, Mum said. You are making a lot of noise. Out, Rupert yelped and threw a slice of bread at Stinker. The bread hit the wall and Stinker held his ground, eyes intense slits of yellow, levelled at Mum. Hey Mum, I said, touching her hand. You haven't seen Stinker for a long time. Did you miss him? It looked like something was turning behind her eyes. He's bigger, isn't he? Yes, he's much bigger now, but do you love him? Aren't you happy to see him again? Suddenly, Rupert had my other arm in a savage lock and was guiding me discreetly into the living room. Just be a minute, Mum, he said in a honeyed voice. But as soon as we were in the other room, he bawled a fist, something he'd never done before. What did I tell you? he growled. She doesn't feel anything, Rupert. She's gone. His fist unclenched and ran the hand through his thinning hair. You think we come from outside ourselves? Is that right? Then where, Dan? Where? Let go of me. We're neurotransmitters, or the absence of neurotransmitters. Nothing more. I struggled out of his arm lock. I'm not neurotransmitters. I love my mother, and that's not neurotransmitters backed away from him. What am I to you? A neurotransmitter? But before he could answer, an unspeakable animal screaming came from the kitchen. <coughs> we looked at each other for a second, the roof and I, before scrambling back through the kitchen door to stare in horror at what we saw. After I left the kitchen for that final time, after trying to wrap my head around what I saw in there, I would wobble up the stairs into my bedroom and lie on my bed. I would smoke a cigarette, even though Rupert had never allowed me to smoke in his house. It would take me a good few minutes to roll it because my hands would be shaking badly. 
Rupert would still be downstairs. He would have a lot to think about. And Mum would be there too. Or what was left of her. And it would be while I smoked my bent, pathetic cigarette that I would see on my computer screen the flashing new mailbox and I would shuffle over to it and open the mail and the mail would say from Marina Bell at hotmail.com to the truth is out there at yahoo.co.uk subject magical Russian eye exercises hello I only realized that I didn't know your name after we got separated by all those beastly people London can be a grumpy place, can't it? Regardless, here are the exercises. I've put them in an attachment. Anna has helped me. If they aren't there, then please tell me. I'm still new to the internet. I hope you and your brother are having fun in London. I thought I heard you say that your mother had been thawed. I think my hearing must be going too. Please let me know if they work for you. The exercises, that is. Yours, Elena. X. Then I would open the attachment and start doing what its insides told me to do. Then I would move out. And I've never said this to my brother, but the only thing that would ever take me close to hating him was the fact that when he looked at something living, his first thought was always to cut it open to see why it lived. When me and Rupert had crashed back into the kitchen, we saw Mum strangling Stinker to death, his tail flapping in her soup. Mum, what the hell? Rupert spluttered. I went to try and pull the cat out of her grip, but it was too late. Stinker made a final and died. You wouldn't stop making noise, Mum said, as she put the corpse on the table like it was her handbag. Rupert looked at Mum, then at Stinker, then at me. I mouthed the word, empty. You prick, he yelled, making mum jump in her wheelchair. I can't believe we're brothers, I really can't. This is obviously something to do with her frameworks of, of social and, 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 and moral principle, which, which because of the length of her stasis, you know, you know she, she, she hasn't yet uh, reconciled to, to, to her, her actions. He was staring at poor Stinker, stretched out on the table. In other words, I said, neurotransmitters? I felt so creepy. Mum was just looking out of the window. The roop looked haggard. I will not be lectured to by someone whose education consists of X-Files repeats and sleeping until fucking lunchtime. I took you in, Daniel. I took you in and I brought you up and you still... He sighed and rubbed his palms into his eyes. I got really hurt and angry, and I was going to say something back. There were plenty of things I could have said, but I didn't. Instead, I walked out of the kitchen. Stinker's tail was still in the soup, which was tomato. Rupert Don't Know was written by Glenn James Brown. The narrator was Alexander King. Music and sound design by Ian J. Cole. Glenn James Brown's novel, Ionopolis, is out now from Parthian Books. See the show notes for links. You've been listening to An Endless Sky, a podcast of strange and beautiful words and music. Find us on Twitter at An Endless Sky. Thanks for listening.